the largest electric and gas utility in the country, uh, the largest electric and gas municipal utility in the country, is in San Antonio. It's CPS Energy. It's been a leader in moving towards clean and low carbon generation with gas, with nuclear, with cleaner coal, and with renewables. And the CEO, Doyle Benneby, is here with us today. Mr. Benneby, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's uh, very good to be here, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thanks to your, to your team for inviting us. Uh, we love to tell our story. Um, I'll start by saying uh, I represent uh, CPS Energy. Uh, as uh, the uh, opening said, the largest electric and gas utility in the country for, mu for munis. Uh, we reside in San Antonio, Texas. I'll start by saying uh, Texas is going to stay in the union. Uh, we're not seceding. Uh, 50 is a nice round symmetrical number. 49 doesn't sound so good. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, second thing I'll say is my slides are fairly uh, simple, not as complex as some of the previous ones. So the good news is you won't have to do much thinking. Uh, maybe the bad news is you've got to pay more attention to what I say. Um, but, um, but how do we describe our energy future? I mean, we've given that a whole lot of thought. I've given that a lot of thought my entire career. And I think uh, we're on a path in San Antonio that I'm really excited to share with you today. Um, I'm going to give you the utility perspective. Um, it's some, somewhat more of an inside out as opposed to an outside in, uh, but we think we have a model that really gets to some of the issues. Um, some say in order to reach our energy future, uh, you've got to have a lot of things happen. You've got to have a carbon tax. Uh, you've got to have a nuclear renaissance. Uh, uh, natural gas prices have to reach $5 per million BTU. Uh, you've got to have the maturation of uh, newer technologies, um, battery storage, um, electric vehicles. Maybe some say the Republicans have to take the Senate, the Democrats have to take the House. I mean, who knows? There are all these things out there uh, that really, to me, uh, result in paralysis. But I think there is a way forward, and I'd like to talk to you about that today. Um, I think there are really uh, a few big factors out there, big risks, uh, that probably uh, summarize all the things that I just talked about. I think the first big risk is uh, environmental impact. Um, a lot of the decisions that you would make today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, future energy choices revolve around avoiding or trying to avoid uh, the capital required to go back and retrofit um, equipment because of uh, more stringent environmental standards and pollution standards. So one big factor I think that causes this sort of uh, paralysis to a degree is fear of uh, the negative impacts of uh, the changing environmental regulation and that really covers a multitude. The second big negative impact I think are technology options. On the surface, that wouldn't sound like a, a negative, but I think part of the issue today is there's so many choices on a spectrum of new technologies. Um, there are several different versions of clean coal. Uh, there are several versions of uh, combined cycle natural gas, several different versions of energy storage, compressed air, um, battery storage. So there are all these technologies that we really didn't have to deal with years ago. It's no longer a sort of a binary decision-making process. It's very amorphous, very nonlinear, and changing all the time. The third, I think, is uh, considering fuel types, um, an array of different fuel types. And part of the risk is, do you invest in a fuel type that's on a wrong end of the uh, supply-demand curve, or a fuel type that's going to be hit with uh, uh, commodity price spikes for something that happens halfway around the world? So all these generally are, some of the, to me, some of the big, uh, I'd say, three factors. There are many others, but they sort of incorporate a lot of things I talked about in the beginning. And they, they lead in, uh, to, to me, lead to uh, somewhat paralysis and kind of waiting for things to happen. Um, my career is uh, in the electric utility industry business. Um, I work most of my career in investor owned. I'm a, at a Muni right now. And I can say, no matter where we are, uh, we are species that we want to be third in line to try something first. So all this really leads to a lot of, um, I think, uh, slower decision making paralysis and keeps us away from what I think is that promising uh, energy future. Um, one of the ways that uh, we'd like to think about it is that uh, the metaphor I like to think about is if you're making a decision today, it's tantamount to uh, you know, shooting a missile today and trying to hit a target uh, that's moving and try to, to, to hit that target about five to seven years out. So I have a little missile up there. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's no warhead on it. It's, uh, we're, we're not... Uh, or warlike types in the electric utility business. So that's a very, very benign missile, uh, just a metaphor. 
Um, but really, today, uh, many are tasked with kind of pressing that button today and hoping that you're going to be right. And it's a very, very difficult decision. I think there are several ways to look at that, and we like to think of it as uh, there's a, a, a sort of a, a guidance system, a path, a bandwidth, that if you stay within, um, you can really make some choices that lead you there. And the bandwidth, I think, uh, on the inside of it starts with economics. Um, this all has to make sense. In San Antonio, we're very, very similar to Los Angeles in the sense that we're a muni utility. So we've employed a lot of, uh, I think, technologies that perhaps uh, the risk model wouldn't, wouldn't fit in an investor own. However, um, we, are, we have the lowest rates of any top 10 major city in the country. We have the lowest rates of any major utility in Texas. So affordability is at the forefront of what, the way we look at it. So uh, that's really, really vital. This stuff has to keep rates within the bandwidth that your community stays with you. So I think first and foremost, you have to consider the economic dynamics. I think a lot of things that I'll talk about today, the decision making on the decision making spectrum, uh, a lot of these uh, technologies afford you fixed pricing uh, for 15, 20, 25, 30 years out. So that's very, very important. The second um, is really uh, community involvement. Um, that comes natural with a municipal utility. Uh, we're owned by the city, although our board is uh, uh, semi-independent. But you have to have the community with you. And the community is engaging more. And I think um, uh, they're telling us what they want. Uh, one of the technologies we have employed is uh, our home area networks, uh, a, a technology in a company called Concert. And basically, we're going to deploy these in about uh, a third of the homes in San Antonio. And our customer, customers will have a wireless means to uh, control their energy use and also a two-way means to communicate with us. And they can really tell us what they want by the choices they make. Uh, we've been able to achieve roughly two kilowatts per household of demand reduction. So there's really a, a monetary benefit for our customers. And for us, as this technology becomes more mature, we can, on the back end, retire old uh, high heat rate inefficient power plants. So there's a, a monetary benefit for the utility also. But this is really uh, an opportunity for our customers to talk to us and tell us what their choices are. Secondly, um, just like most communities, a lot of our communications happen through social media today. Uh, our customers let us know uh, when we do something wrong. They let us know when they're out of service. So all these things are ways that the customers uh, can now talk to us and they represent the community. If you look at the larger body of the community, if you look at some of our lawmakers, you look at our regulators, you look at even adjoining communities and sometimes adjoining states, that's a larger community too that you have to really listen to, our industrial customers. So our view is if you're gonna stay in this kind of bandwidth, um, it's important that uh, communities be intensely involved and the utilities listen and make choices based on what the community is telling them. The third is, and the mayor talked about this, our public-private partnerships, very, very vital. In our case, unlike Los Angeles, we have chosen to not purchase um, our technologies. We want to purchase the energy. So we've utilized uh, purchase power agreements, and we let our uh, private entities take the capital risk to bring the capital to, to the table. And so um, it's very, very important to align that. What we bring to the table is a community willing to uh, buy a product, buy energy, for 20 years out at a fixed price. What we bring to the table is AA plus credit rating, um, which, is, which is gold to investors. What they bring to the table is the technological risk taking, because if the technologies that don't work, and I'll talk about some of them soon, uh, we don't buy the energy. So it's a very, very, uh, I think, symbiotic relationship that's worked for us. We recently have formed seven partnerships, uh, seven partnerships with seven different companies uh, and six different technologies in the last two years. Um, everything from uh, LED lights, uh, similar to Los Angeles. We're in the process right now of converting our high pressure sodium vapor lights to LED lights. Um, we uh, expect to get about 10 megawatts of demand reduction just for 25,000 lights converted. Uh, the company, a company called Green Star, now owned by Toshiba, uh, not only provided the lights to us, but they, reloc they relocated their headquarters uh, from another location in Texas to San Antonio, because that's what we said we wanted as a part of the deal. So we've been able to create this, uh, in addition to a purchase power agreement, PPA, where we buy the energy, we've created what we call EDAs, economic development uh, agreements. And so uh, we've said, we'll buy your product, we'll bring our credit rating to the table, uh, we'll give you that predictable cash flow over long spectrum, but you've got to invest in our community. You've got to bring jobs, and you've got to invest in education. And almost every company of those seven have, has done that. 
we announced this year, early this year, a, a deal for 400 megawatts of solar to be built around San Antonio in Texas. And our partner, a company called OCI, um, has agreed to deliver 805 jobs at a minimum, an investment of 115 million in capital, and also a hefty investment in education. Uh, I mentioned the company Concert that employs home area networks for us, same deal. They relocated their, their company from Raleigh, North Carolina to San Antonio. Uh, they're creating jobs and uh, they've also invested heavily in education. So that's really been our model, but I think uh, there's a, a, a big opportunity for uh, public and private partnerships to really get this going and spur many communities, uh, many companies to really move aggressively towards this uh, uh, future energy um, or energy future. So um, that's really a big part of what we do. So the last uh, or the second to the last uh, visual there is that's kind of the space for us. Um, we want to stay within those bounds and employ those, uh, those, those three uh, options. Now, they're not all inclusive. Um, you know, they cover other things too. But for our community, that's what's worked. And I think each community, um, whether they be a local community, whether they be state, um, I think has to consider that. So this is a way, an approach to take it somewhat uh, inside out. Um, I love what the governor said. I think there's still things that need to be done uh, on a federal level to help spur uh, some of these things, but I think there's so much to do uh, for communities until that time happens. Um, one of the uh, quotes and metaphors I like, it's been attributed to uh, either Bill Walsh or Steve Young, the old quarterback for the 49ers, who at the time was the most accurate passer in NFL history, and they asked him, how, you know, how are you so accurate? And he said, uh, well, the way to be accurate is to avoid doing the things it takes to be inaccurate. And to some degree, I think to get to our energy future, um, we don't have to necessarily get it exactly right today, but I think we've got to employ uh, those technologies um, that keep us within the bandwidth of avoiding getting it wrong. And I think getting it wrong generally is going to be uh, if you have a bias for uh, options that are, are heavy carbon intense or heavy pollution intense. Um, we made a decision in San Antonio two years ago, uh, instead of investing $500, $500 million in a uh, flue gas and sulfurizer uh, to instead uh, accelerate the retirement of, of our two coal units and reinvest that, uh, those funds, redirect those funds into to buying a natural gas plant. Gas is you know, roughly uh, uh, twice as clean as coal, uh, no particulate matter, and it's really a good trade-off. And, and, and we also, in Texas uh, and in San Antonio, almost sit over uh, one of the largest uh, shale gas reserves in the country. So those are the kinds of things uh, I think that really, really make sense. So those are the trade-offs that we've started to make uh, in this dynamic. And we didn't really wait on some of the things I talked about. We didn't wait on um, um, predictable carbon prices. We didn't wait on a carbon tax or, or some kind of a levy. I think those are options that uh, uh, communities can make today. We also uh, have invested in a project called Summit. It's in West Texas. It'll be either the first or second commercially viable integrated gasification combined cycle plant. Um, so it really, uh, through a Siemens gasifier, extracts a whole lot of the pollutants out of the uh, synthetic fuel, and 90% of the CO2 is captured and, um, and redirected to um, the Permian Basin for enhanced oil recovery in Texas. So we've taken an approach that is somewhat uh, non-ideological, um, and I think that really keeps us, keeps us in a place that we get a broad spectrum of community support. My view is that I happen to, uh, to, uh, to lead a company in an industry that accounts for roughly 40% of uh, the pollution emissions that go in the air. Um, probably transportation is another 20%. And I like to say everything from the exhaust from lawnmowers to cow flatulence might be the last 20%. At any rate, um, if we can impact that in a way that's affordable and supported by our community, why wouldn't we do it? Irrespective of where I stand on the dimension of uh, whether or not uh, um, climate change is caused by human, human intervention or a cycle of nature. It's somewhat immaterial. Um, we're going to do the right thing, and I think the right thing is to focus on these technologies uh, that are low carbon intense, low pollution intense, and those decisions can be made today. So, so my view is um, the energy future is now. Uh, we can move now. Decisions can be made now to impact it. And uh, I have about one minute left, so I'll, I'll close with... Uh, Another quote that I like that's been attributed to uh, uh, Sir Winston Churchill, and uh, he said about the United States that 
Uh, you can always count on the United States to do the right thing, but only after it's tried everything else first. And to some degree, I think uh, we're doing the right things now. We're not waiting. And I think uh, San Antonio is a community that I hope uh, embodies that. We have a dynamic mayor of our own, Julian Castro, some of you might have heard of him, uh, who ha also has a project called SA 2020. And his goal is to uplift the city along other dimensions, education, uh, parks, recreation, investments, and we're a part of that. So we're a shining star and we hope that we're a model uh, for other communities and other companies to make decisions that lead us to our energy future now. Thank you.